Hi, welcome to segment two of our four-part podcast series with Professor Siobhan Madison. Today, we'll resume our conversation where we left off last time. Enjoy. Yeah, I know you and your colleagues spend a lot of time assessing the evolution of the human family. Uh, Could you share some perspectives on the evolution of female-centric and male-centric societies? I know it's a big topic, so we can break it out into parts. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, thank you for that question. I think Overall, it's hard to say anything very um, sort of singular in response to that question, right? Because there's so much variation. And that is often my sort of conclusion about everything. And in some ways, I guess that's like unsatisfying, but um, (laughs) it's not a great soundbite. But I think it's the reality. And I think it's a really important one because, um, so again, I'm not personally yet in my career. I'm not um, using the stuff that I've learned to try and direct political outcomes or things like that. But I'm very conscious of the potential for that to happen um, when people read about the research findings. And um, I think, you know, human behavioral ecology, when we think about male-centered societies and female-centered societies, it's really easy to use a kind of evolutionary perspective to say that, for example, you know, humans are evolved from an ancestor that looks very similar to modern chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. Um, And therefore that our evolutionary root is a patrilineal one or a patriarchal one or a patrilocal one, depending on um, what you're looking at. But I think the reality is a lot more complicated than that. And so much of what we know about contemporary human organization is based on a wave of sort of Eurocentric migration and um, patterns of organization that may not extend very far beyond that. So there might be a lot more of a bias um, toward female centrality, I think, than a lot of contemporary folks um, maybe acknowledge. And coming back to this issue of why that matter, right, why that might matter, I think, in terms of how we understand humanity and then what we do with that understanding, like, there have been anthropologists who um, believe very strongly in monogamy and one person being married to one other person for their entire life. And for the male being the breadwinner of the family and for women sort of supporting the man in that activity. Um, and it affects, it can affect legislation. So I know of colleagues that have, um, been expert witnesses in legal cases where they're trying to decide whether it's appropriate to allow people to have multiple wives, for example, or, um, thinking about how to, um, allocate resources toward women versus men, um, in the home versus in the workplace. And, if we think that humans are constrained to this one model of male breadwinner being married to a single woman who's supporting children, it's a very constraining model for human behavior. And if we understand that the landscape of human organization is much wider than that, I think it affects the way, the ways that we think about, you know, what is reasonable and Mm -hmm. what we allow people to do and what the consequences of those actions may be. Yeah. What would you say, I guess, the factors that contributed toward that origination of those male-centric societies? Yeah, there are some great um, hypotheses about this, and there are lots of them, and I don't think we know the answer. But I think that um, there's some great stuff in sort of economic anthropology that really coincides with the way behavioral ecologists think about this, too, that when we engage in a kind of intensification of subsistence. Like we go from kind of a backyard garden to a huge farm that involves irrigation or plowing or things like that, that really amp up productivity that when that happens, men can become much more interested in taking control of that subsistence space So um, you will often see like very male centered societies being ones where um, agriculture is the predominant form of subsistence. 
Mm-hmm. And you're less likely to see that in places where horticulture or these kind of backyard gardens are more predominant. Like those tend to be more female centered societies. Um, and if you think about a lot of like Euro American, it, you know, society is built on that kind of agricultural legacy, I think. And so the sort of contemporary bias toward patrilineal and patriarchy, I think, has its origins, at least in the last several thousand years, probably in an agricultural kind of mode of subsistence. And I don't know if any of that makes sense. So you can ask me questions to break it down. But I think that's really the way a lot of folks in behavioral ecology are still thinking about that. Yeah. How would you compare that to female centric societies and I guess the origination and formation of those in comparison? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think that personally, like all societies are on some level female centered, whether they want to acknowledge that or not. Um, You know, there are so many different ways you can think about this, but like the death of a mom to a child is much more impactful than the death of a father. And that doesn't mean that fathers don't matter or that, you know, their contributions are variable but that kind of consistency of the maternal importance, I think, um, again, maternal sort of factors being the most consistent element in families, I think, you know, that's hard to deny. So there's always this kind of mother-child bond and then the bonds that the mom builds around her, I think, that are really important across societies. So in some ways, you can think of that as, you know, women being really important everywhere, like I'm going to start this new book project, I hope, in the next year or two. And one of the thought experiments that I am going to hope to kind of ask people to think about is whether we can envision a society that doesn't have women as part of that society and what that looks like versus Mm -hmm. thinking about a society that doesn't have men and whether that functions and what that what that looks like. Right. I could ask you, you know, what your answers to that would be. And they probably wouldn't be very different from mine. but Um, I think if you do that thought experiment, it tells you that women are really critical, right? And they are everywhere. Um, Then there are these places in a lot lot of the parts of the world, maybe the majority of the world now, where um, men have taken on larger roles in the family around that kind of female center. And like I said, I think that may be tied to things like agriculture. There's a role for just cultural transmission and things like that too. But um, I think at the core, a lot of societies are really female centered. um, And the ones where that becomes more, um, I don't know what the right word is, but where it becomes really core to the structure of the whole society, like a matrilineal society. I think those are ones where um, there's enough need for women to really group together to protect themselves and their children and the the resources that they're using to live. Um, But it's not so intensified that men become interested in taking over. So that's why I think you often see it in contexts of horticulture or um, fishing is another one where you see a lot of matrilineal societies where men are off often doing other things or Um, Warfare is another context where you see matrilineal quite often. And then even in the Caribbean, like there's a lot of cultures there that are nominally patrilineal, but where um, men are off or their livelihoods are uncertain enough that the women still kind of are at the core of those societies. They call those matrifocal. Um, So I think it's pretty common, actually, and much more so than, you know, again, maybe like anthropologists anyway, have talked about in the last 40 or 50 years. I Actually, I agree with that statement. I think that, you know, women do play a very critical role in different societies, not just matrilineal and matriarchal. Um, But it's just not as, I guess, it's not portrayed in, I guess, conversation and journalism of how women play that central role. And you, would, um, I before we continue, I just kind of wanted to clarify um, the difference between matrilineal and matriarchal, because I know that a lot of people often mix that up. Yeah, it's a great question, um, and it's a little bit of a sticky one, but I think it's important, right? Yeah, maybe less important than people think. I don't know. I my my sort of positions on this are evolving too as time goes on, but 
you know, standardly we say matriliney refers to one of two things, descent, which is, you know, kind of like who you get your name from, what lineage you feel you belong to, where your clan is, whether that's traced through men or through women, um, or inheritance, which is like the transmission of stuff, right? So where does the house go? Where does the money go? Um, those are sort of two axes where we that we would call referred to as matrilineal. And if those move through women in whatever way, there's some different variations for the specific ways that happen. But if it fundamentally moves through women, we call that matrilineal. Um, matriarchal, as the opposite of patriarchal, would sort of imply that women are in charge, that they have authority, and that they have authority over everyone, over themselves. They have autonomy but they're also in positions of authority over men. Um, and right now, you know, the standard line in anthropology anyway, is that there are, say, 16% or more of the societies of the world are matri something sort of female centered in some way or another, um, but that there are no matriarchal societies, that even in those cases where you would see women inheriting or women being the basis of descent, that some man would still be in charge of the family, usually like the mother's brother or something like that. Um, I personally, you know, as I've doing this, as I've been doing this for longer, I'm questioning that a little bit because I think, you know, I work in a culture with the Moso people in Southwest China where nominally the mother's brother is in charge. And there is no question that he's really important and that he's a ceremonial figure and all these things. But day to day, what I see there is that grandmothers are making really important decisions, that women are making really important decisions, um, and that those decisions are impacting men. So on some level, you know, that starts to approach matriarchy, I think, um, in a way that maybe has been a little bit under-recognized, but I'd probably be the first person to say that. So it's not what everybody's talking about at the moment. Do you know of any systems in the past that were both mat matrilineal and matriarchal? I know there might be um, a few indigenous cultures in North America, but would you happen to know any? I'd be happy to get your perspective on that question, actually, because, again, from the anthropology side, we say that there have never, there are no and have never been any matriarchal societies, that there is always the male authoritative figure. So um, I'm not sure about that. It's really hard to know when a lot of the, you know, ethnographic materials describing these cultures are being written by men, I think. So I don't know, but that's what the standard line is. Mm -hmm. I've heard that there may be some in, or there may have been some in North America, but I'm not quite sure um, specifically if, you know, where, where um, those would, like which cultures those would be in. Um, so no, I, I actually don't, don't have any specific ones either. <laughs> Right. Well, if you hear of any, let me know. I mean, I um, I think I think there's a potential for bias in the kinds of ways that we describe this. Much much like you said before, you know, women are often doing things that are pretty critical and important, but they get sort of short shrift compared to the stuff that's really visible. Um, and I think that's true. And I think a lot of the methodology that we use to determine who has high status and who's in charge and who's making decision really biases the outcome toward men. Um, and I think if we revise some of that methodology that we're gonna get some really different answers. So I guess stay tuned, you know.